Hi, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this last session. Uh, so today, uh, this session, we'll, I will be talking about an introduction to 5G, which is called as the new generation in the cellular communications. Uh, it's also called as NR in the cellular community, where uh, NR stands for new radio. And what challenges we are facing as the, the wireless community is progressing further ahead uh, with 5G and the advancements uh, in this uh, field. A little introduction about myself. So my name is Rizwan Ghaffar. Uh, I have been the technical lead of 5G wireless development. So I have an industrial experience of wireless development for about now 15 years. So I have worked on 3G, 4G, and now 5G development. So these are the generations of the wireless communications. So it started from 1G and 2G. In old days, once we used to have the GSM phones, and then it moved to 3G, which is CDMA-based, then 4G, which we normally know as LTE, and then 5G is the, uh, is the new wireless standard. I've also worked on the, on the Wi-Fi modems, which is again a cellular, uh, which is again a wireless standard, but different from cellular communication. So uh, I do some research also. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the 5G NR, which is uh, fifth generation of wireless communication, of cellular communication, new radio, right? Uh, so what are the requirements? What are the use cases, right? And how did this wireless uh, standard evolve, right? So I would talk about first the requirements. What were the requirements that we thought, the people in the wireless industry thought that LTE or 4G is not enough, we should move ahead and get to a, a new standard, right? So we all know it's all about uh, data rates, right? We want a data rate of megabits per second, gigabits per second, right? That's, that's one, uh, one thing that all of us understand, that how the, uh, the communication protocols are developing because we want higher data rates. But it's not only data rates, right? If we look at this, here I'm, I have uh, uh, jotted down what are the requirements that led us to move from LTE to 5G, right? So, it's low latency. Low latency means a quick communication, right? You want your packet to be transmitted, to be received in a very short amount of time. There should be no, uh, there should be not be much processing delays on that. We'll talk about it in, in detail, what does that mean? Then, uh, relative to LTE, people wanted more energy efficient devices. Why energy efficient devices? Because the, the industry was moving towards IoT. We wanted sensors to be deployed everywhere, right? A sensor, is, um, a sensor is there in your car, a sensor is there on your TV, on your fridge. All those sensors, they needed some energy efficient communications. All those sensors were not able to be connected to the, uh, to the power. We wanted more mobility robustness, right? So that means that as we go higher in the speed, right, we wanted the communications to be reliable. That, that means if you are uh, if you are on an aeroplane, if you are on a speed train, and on a high speed train, your communication should not be disrupted. You should still be able to get those higher data rates that we generally see uh, in static environment, right? Then some other things we will talk of minimum overhead and forward, uh, and, uh, forward compatible. But once we come upon these requirements, right, what were the use cases that the people were thinking of? What were the use cases that a general person was thinking of, that these use cases were enabling uh, these requirements were enabling those use cases, right? So uh, one was this uh, EMBB, which is called Enhanced Mobile Broadband, which we know we wanted a higher data rates, right? We wanted we want the HD, HD videos to be downloaded in a couple of seconds in sort of taking minutes. So we want a higher data rate, right? We wanted this MMTC, which is Massive Machine Type Communication. That's where the IoT, the concept of IoT comes on, right? So machine type communication, it's not a human being who is interacting. The call is not for a human being to receive. It's not a person who is pressing a button to download something, right? It's the machines which are communicating with each other. Your fridge is talking with your TV or your air conditioning is talking with the thermostat, right? All those things uh, where the, the idea was that the machines talk with each other instead, uh, instead of a human being interacting and uh, directing those communications, right? Then another uh, idea that brought to this uh, revolution in the wireless field was URLLC, right? URLLC is basically, we'll talk more, but it's ultra reliable low latency communication, right? You wanted your communications to be very reliable. 
in which scenarios, right? We, we are talking of now autonomous driving, we are talking of vehicle to vehicle communication, we are talking of things where uh, in industry, the whole industry, uh, one industrial complex is lit up with different sensors which are talking with each other, right? A machine going into a, uh, going to a fault should be immediately communicated to prevent some disasters, to prevent some mishaps, right? So in, uh, in health field, right, a sensor in your heart is, ta is talking with, with a device with the doctor has, right, where you wanted these communications to be ultra reliable. You do not want to afford an error in a bit that is sent uh, by a device uh, to, uh, let's say, to a surgeon, right? You don't want a wrong signal to be sent. So there, the, uh, this idea of ultra-reliable communication came in, right? And it led to new spectrum. So, so we have some requirements. We had some use cases. So this was all clear that these requirements are coming up. We have some use cases. But how we can achieve those, right? We wanted higher data rates. We wanted uh, very reliable communications. But how we can achieve this? That's where these enablers come, came in, right? So these enablers were, how these enablers came up was that at one point of time, we used to have one antenna in our device. Now we have, we have four antennas, and these enablers would develop that your phone would have, would have uh, 20s of antennas, right? Your base station would have hundreds of antennas. So something which we call as the MIMO, massive MIMO, or uh, uh, multiple input, multiple output systems, but the basic idea is you have, more, uh, you have more antennas to communicate with each other. You have different waveforms and numerologies, right? So these are all the enablers that we will talk in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, right? So in this session, we will be talking of three main things, right? What are the use cases which the 5G is talking of? How those use cases can be enabled? And the last part, which would be, what are the challenges that now 5G is facing? as it is going to into uh, to its full scale deployment right so first let's talk of the use cases i already talked some uh, a little bit about the use cases but let's talk in detail what the what the use cases are so i have divided these use cases into four different four categories right one is this massive iot which is internet of things right which uh, we are familiar with then vehicular communication or autonomous driving again something which is uh, which is of high value for the, uh, for the next generation of the wireless communications. Then industrial automation and what effect would be on cloud computing and big data. So let's talk of uh, massive IoT, which in the, in the wireless field is called as MMTC, which is massive machine type communication, right? So as I said, it's the machines which are talking with each other. So once the LTE or the fourth generation of wireless communication was designed, it was designed for mobile devices. You have a mobile phone in your pocket, you have a laptop, you have an iPad, you have a tablet. So those communication protocols were designed keeping in view those devices. At that point of time, it was not thought that the, uh, that the industry would develop to, a, to an extent where these wireless protocols could be put up in a sensor, in a small sensor, which is there uh, which are spread in your home in different places, right? Which, are, which can be embedded in your, in your body, which can be embedded in your watches, right? So those type of, so LT was not designed to keep uh, for, for those type of devices. That's where then the 5G came up, that these challenges of the Internet of Things, these massive uh, devices, these massive machine type communications, how they, that those can be solved. And that's where this, uh, the, the 5G came in, and it solved these challenges which the massive IoT was, uh, which, which this massive IoT was, uh, uh, was, uh, was coming forward with, right? So now look at this, right? Your sensors, what, what all we have, right, in these massive machine type communications. You have smart buildings, you need to have object tracking, right? Your object is going, some parcel is being delivered, you put a sensor and it is being tracked where it is at this point of time, right? You do you need to do environmental monitoring. You want to do voice over data. You want to do some energy management, your power metering, coming into variables. So all these use cases come under this uh, paradigm of massive IoT or massive machine type communications, right? The requirements for these were that you, you, you need to have long range communications in some cases, right? Like a, an object being tracked. You need, you need to enable those long range communications you need to have massive scales, right? You need to have power efficient devices, and you need to have extremely simple devices, right? You cannot, so your, your phone is costing around 
800 to 1000 dollars uh, uh, a high end phone is costing that much right but once you try to put these sensors in in the devices you cannot afford to put such a uh, such uh, such an extremely complex system in a in a device which is just co costing 20 dollars right now we are talking of those trackings which uh, small sensors which would be put in let's say with your keychains uh, with your tv remote so you can track them so there it was not desired to put these uh, uh, these complex systems. So the idea was to make the systems extremely simple so that if you don't need those higher data rates, you just scale down the systems and you can produce sensors which are costing less than a dollar so that you can put up, uh, put those things in the, uh, massively in the, uh, in the low end devices, right? So that's, uh, uh, that's what we meant by the massive machine type communication. And then it led to basically uh, our vehicular communication, right? Autonomous driving. We want uh, we want our vehicle to communicate with so many things, right? So this terminology is called V2X, vehicular to infrastructure, right? Your vehicle needs to talk to whom? Your vehicle your vehicle wants to talk with another vehicle, which is just yeah, please. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I will do that. I will do that. Yeah, I will do that. Uh, right, so, uh, right, your vehicle is going to talk with whom, right? It has to talk with the vehicle which is in front to prevent a collision, right? We need to have vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Again, it's a machine-type communication. It's not a human being interacting with another human being. It's a vehicle which needs to interact with another vehicle. It's a vehicle which needs to interact with the infrastructure, right? Your vehicle needs to talk, let's say, with the traffic signal to figure out whether it is red or... Uh, is green, right, to, 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 uh, to decide its action. It needs to talk with the pedestrian to uh, ensure that it doesn't collide with that, right? It needs to talk with the network, right? So this all vehicular communication, how this communication can be, can be achieved, right? If we look at autonomous driving, right, your vehicle is equipped with so many sensors, with radars, right? How these would communicate with each other? You can, you can lay Millions, you can, miles of uh, wire should be laid within a car so that these different sensors talk to each other, right? Which, uh, which makes these systems pretty complex. But then 5G came up with a solution that these all sensors can talk with each other on a wireless medium. You don't need to lay those wires, right? Your, vehicular can, your vehicle can talk with the vehicle which is in front of it, right? You don't need a, you don't need a, a physical connection. You can, by wireless connection, your vehicle can talk with all these things. So that's what they, uh, the, the terminology came as, as V2X, that vehicle is talking to infrastructure, it is for, uh, talking to everything. Uh, these communications need to be extremely reliable, right? You cannot uh, afford uh, an error in these communications because these communications are related, uh, an error in these communications would not lead to a video being dropped, right? Or a packet being missed or an SMS being dropped. They would lead to some uh, some mishaps, they can lead to some accidents, they can lead to loss of life, where they, these communications needed, need to be extremely reliable. And they need to be low latency. That means that once a vehicle, uh, once a vehicle gives a signal to the next vehicle that I'm going to collide, it should be, the, the time between this cannot be 100 milliseconds, right? We are not talking of 100 milliseconds. It has to be within two or three milliseconds, or even less than a millisecond where a vehicle tells the other vehicle that I am going to collide with you, Right? and some actions needs to be taken. So that's where this idea or this terminology came, which says URLLC, right? a terminology widely used in 5G, which means ultra-reliable and low-latency communication. So it has two characteristics. One is ultra-reliable, which comes with the reliability and comes with the low-latency communications. Right? With, with, reliability, with reliability, another example we can understand is for the, for the aircraft communications. Right? With the aircrafts, with the fighter aircrafts, right? once an aircraft gets, uh, let's say uh, there are two aircrafts and one aircraft catches fire. The other aircraft has to tell the second aircraft pilot to eject, right? There you cannot afford uh, a latency of, 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 uh, of 100 milliseconds, right? That, they see that uh, communication has to be done within, within, uh, within, within one or two milliseconds, right? And action has to be taken. So that's where this, uh, the idea of ultra reliability and low latency communication came, which has, uh, which has so many use cases, right? And uh, another use case is industrial automation, right? Where again, the, uh, the industry is going towards this, where they do not want 
humans to, uh, to monitor, right? So the machines have their sensors, and those sensors are the ones which are monitoring uh, a machine's efficiency. It is running. If there is a fault comes, the, the fault is detected, and it is communicated, right? Now look at, uh, look at a, an industrial complex, right? Hundreds and thousands of machines, which we need to connect with each other, right? So do we want to connect them with wired networks or a wireless network? with sensors, how these sensors would communicate uh, with, the, uh, with the central controller, which is controlling this whole system, right? So that's where 5G is evolving towards uh, this area where, uh, where, where it would lead to this uh, industrial uh, automation, right? That's what is said is the a terminology people use is also a connected screwdriver. Right? You want your every screwdriver to be connected, right, to be controlled. Uh, and uh, and to be monitored, right? Uh, another use case which uh, which comes with the uh, uh, with the five G is the cloud computing and big data, right? Something which uh, which a terminology with which we are familiar with. So be because your communication is going into the direction where you are reducing latency, right? That's your response time, right? Where uh, your packet or your transmission from your transmitter to receiver is getting delivered uh, is quickly in the, in the matter of few milliseconds, right? And increase in potential capacity, right? Now your devices can have higher data rates. They can process large amounts of data. So how this is going to affect the cloud computing and the big data, right? So your, your devices are no more dumb, right? You don't want... Uh, Though cloud would still remain there, but now there is a processing that a device can do, right? With these higher data rates, your device can do a lot instead of offloading everything to the cloud, cloud computing everything, and then giving back to the device. Your devices are no more dumb, right? They have higher data rate, complex, and intelligent devices, right? So, uh, of course, we will have more sensors, thousands of sensors being deployed uh, in industries, right? Hundreds of sensors being deployed in a home, right? For this, we don't need wired connections. We, we don't want those, those all, uh, all devices to be connected by wire, by wire right? So there this, uh, so what that would lead, which is already leading to the, towards these two ideas, right? That's edge computing and distributed, uh, distributed cloud, right? So you have more intelligence and more computing to migrate from your cloud to your device because your devices have higher data rates. They are more capable of doing this, uh, doing this processing, right? So there, the idea of uh, uh, cloud computing is, would be moving towards edge computing, right? And uh, similar idea of the distributed cloud, right? You are enabling placing of your workloads closer to the edge, right, with a better quality of service. So th these were few of the, uh, of the use cases that people thought of, that the industry was thinking that these are the use cases, but how we can achieve those, right? This is where these enablers came, where the 5G came. So there was 4G, there was LTE, but LTE was not sufficient to do that. So then how we can achieve this, how we can achieve these higher data rates, how we can achieve these low latency communications, how we can increase the reliability of the communications, right? So the, the, the standard has these, and these main enablers which enabled, uh, which enabled the transition from LTE to 5G, which enabled to achieve those objectives uh, which we needed for the use cases that, uh, that, uh, that I discussed before, right? So one of the key enablers is, is the spectrum, right? So if, if we look at the frequency spectrum, you do not, so LTE is also able to uh, transmit data rate of gigabits per second. But the problem is it doesn't have the spectrum. There is no spectrum available for an LTE device to communicate to those higher data rates. Now, from where this spectrum comes? This spectrum come is called as, uh, this spectrum is the frequency spectrum, right? Your frequency spectrum has been divided. Some spectrum is being used by TV services, some is using by police, some is using by military, and then you have some spectrum available for the wireless or the cellular communications, right? So there, uh, what happened was, so, uh, so new ideas came, right? But one was this uh, the NR-based LAA, LAA, right? Which is uh, how the NR can, how the 5G or NR can operate an unlicensed spectrum, right? Uh, we also NR also opened the the the, the spectrum which is in uh, millimeter wave, right? A spectrum which was not previously being used. So millimeter wave is something which we go over to. Uh, 
28, 39, or 60 gigahertz. Those, those higher frequencies were never used. We'll talk of that, why they were never used. But that's where the, the 5G enabled uh, those uh, enabled those technologies where we were able to use those uh, higher uh, uh, those higher frequencies, right? So this is what is the uh, those higher frequencies, right? Which are called as the millimeter wave. So if we look at here, right? So this is where generally 3.4. So this is the spectrum around 6 gigahertz where uh, where NR op where 5G operates. But 5G also opened up this spectrum, which is from 24 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, right? Now, what why, so this spectrum was always available. Why LT didn't use it? Why 3G didn't use it, right? Because this spectrum was available. The problem with this spectrum is that as you go higher in the frequency, right, your, uh, your signal goes very weak quickly. That means that if I put a LT base station here, I can communicate around a radius of one mile, right? But if I put a 5G base station here, my range would reduce to 100 meters. So I cannot communicate beyond 100 meters because these are higher frequencies where if you transmit a signal, it attenuates very quickly. So beyond 100 meters, you, there is no coverage. So that was the reason LTE never used it. But then once the 5G came, they, uh, they tried to use this spectrum and how that can be enabled, right? So once you have such limited coverage, right, where beyond 100 meters, there is no signal. You cannot afford to put thousands of base stations in a limited area, right? So then how we can, how, uh, how we can do it, and that was the basic feature of the 5G, that it came up with a beam forming, right? So it came up that instead of having one or two antennas, right, you can have hundreds of antennas, like these are the panels of the antennas, right? And these panels were able to steer your beams. So what in LTE days, what they were doing is there is a base station and it is transmitting everywhere, right? So whether you are in this room or four rooms beyond or even outside the campus, you would still be able to receive the signal because the signal is being communicated all around. But in 5G, they came up with this idea of beam forming, right? That you, the, with these hundreds of antenna panels, right, the technology would be to steer your beams, to focus your beams. So that means that the signal will not be going in all directions. But if a user is there, the, the, the system is going to identify the user and transmit the signal only to that user. That's where your distance would increase from 100 meters to 500 meters. It still not be one mile, but because you're not spreading your energy in all directions, you're focusing your energy on one particular user in one particular direction, you would be able to increase your, your, uh, your range. And this technique which came up in uh, 5G is called as the beam forming or beam steering, right? where these panels, if you look at these panels, right, this is, uh, this is the panel which is, uh, which is transmitting its beam, right? So if you see here, so this is, uh, this is a 5G base station, right, where these are the users and it is trying to communicate with these users particularly. It is transmitting or directing its beams to these users instead of having an all direction communication around this and any user which is coming here would be able to uh, communicate with that, right? And so this technique needs, in fact, uh, tens or hundreds of antennas here, right? So these are then the antenna panels. So the, 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 the previous antennas which we used to see on our car cordless phones, right? You take out your antenna or even in your previous uh, phones, right? Or even if you see it in this phone, right? If you open this phone, you would see an antenna here, an antenna here, an antenna here, right? Just there are antennas in built in it. But, but with these... Uh, these higher frequencies, your antennas reduced in size, right? So look at this antenna panel, right? It's just uh, 56 millimeter by 42 uh, millimeter, right? And there are, and these dot is representing antenna. So there are, so there was a possibility of uh, the packing 20s of antennas within your device, which would be able to uh, do this beam forming, right? And hundreds of antennas here, which is called as uh, massive MIMO, right? Massive. MIMO means massive antennas. You have, you can put hundreds of antennas at your base station, 20s of antennas in your devices, so that this, uh, uh, so that this communication can go through, right? But then it needs some uh, beam forming and beam, beam steering, right? So basically how your antennas communicate, how they, so you have uh, multiple antennas in your device or at your, uh, or at your base station, which uh, which is receiving the signal and is trying to steer the signal in one uh, particular direction, right? So in the end, we have 
high gain directional antennas which would transmit, so instead of transmitting the energy in all directions, it would be transmitting energy only in one direction, right? And, uh, but people have come up, so this is a new communication paradigm, right? Previously, communications have not taken place at that uh, level, right? Now, there are trials being carried out that how effective that communication is, because the problem with that sort of communication could be that if you're holding a phone like this, right? So a beam is being uh, transmitted to this phone, but if you just change the direction of the phone, right? It now uh, the beam has to again recalculate and transmit it towards the uh, towards that phone or towards that station, which in fact leads to this uh, beam steering or how the beams would be uh, how the beams would change their directions, right? So this is this is again a challenge which is uh, which the wireless community is still trying to figure out, right? So as the 5G devices are being prepared and uh, are being launched, so more, uh, the, the massive scale development is expected next year in 2020, though limited scale development has already started in, in, in uh, it started from South Korea, but even in US now in few of the places, the 5G base stations are there, but this is uh, something which would need more trials and determine how effective this uh, communication ranges. So uh, that's where this uh, 5G and our air interface came, right? So we, we are talking of these three bands, right? So it can communicate in low bands, which is 600 megahertz. There are devices, I think T-Mobile is conducting trials and in, in these low bands communication. Then is in, in mid band, which is generally a band reserved for LTE. And here the NR can operate or 5G can operate, but this is the most interesting spectrum because nothing, none of the device has communicated in this spectrum before. So this is the device where, this is the spectrum where the, uh, where the, uh, where the 5G or NR uh, would be massively deployed and would make use of this, right? So uh, based on this, we can look at what are the, uh, what are the solid foundations, right? Which, uh, on which the, uh, the 5G or NR is being built, right? So this is this massive MIMO, right, that I talked of. Hundreds of antennas being uh, used in your, uh, in your base stations, 20s of antennas in your devices, right? And, and then there are some other uh, technical terms. I will talk of this slot-based framework, but the other, like, these, th these two uh, term these three terminologies I won't talk, as, as they are more related to, uh, they are more detailed in wireless field. So, uh, let's talk of these different numerologies, right? What is happening is that, uh, let's, yeah, let me talk this and then I will come back to that slide, right? So this is an LTE frame. With the frame, you can understand it as a packet, right? A packet being transmitted, right? So this was the, the length of an LTE frame. But when NR came, NR, so this frame size is fixed, which is one millisecond, right? So now if I want to transmit something in 0.5 millisecond, I cannot because this is the minimum frame size, or this is the minimum packet size that LTE allows, right? So I cannot transmit something less than one millisecond. And that's where the, uh, the 5G came, and it allowed flexible packet sizes or frame sizes, right? Like so you can have something in 500 microseconds, 250 microseconds, 125 microseconds, right? So something, let's say a signal is to be sent from one device to another, right? Let's say a sensor in your heart is, dry, is trying to communicate some data, which is, which, which is not a lot of data, but some irregularity, right? It doesn't have to wait for one millisecond of time to construct this packet and then transmit, right? It can use just one, one, uh, 125 microsecond or 250 microsecond slot, right? And it can transmit that data. This is where the, uh, the, the idea of these uh, low latency communications that you want your communication to be quick came in, right? And then uh, this is how the, 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 these, these slot structures came, uh, which, uh, which are different from the, uh, which, which are different from the LTE, right? So basically uh, what, uh, what 5G allowed was so you can have different packet sizes, right? You can understand it as different packet sizes. If it's just data, right? Like say you want to download a video, you can always, this is all, all of your data which is coming in, right? But if, if you do not have that data, but you want to have quick communication, you can have just like a mini slot, an idea which is called as mini slot. You can communicate only in this slot, right? You can just uh, do not transmit anything and just transmit a blank slot. So these, this is the flexibility that uh, 5G provided which was not existing in, uh, in LTE, right? 
So these are the different subframe types that, uh, that uh, 5GNR came up. But I would like to talk more about what are the challenges that uh, we are facing in 5GNR, right? So th all these things that came up, right, like multiple numerologies or multiple packet sizes, right? Low latency, like ultra reliability, there are different bandwidths. What all they led, what, what were the challenges that uh, the wireless uh, industry is facing at that time with, this, uh, uh, <coughs> with, these, uh, with these new developments, right? So first there is, there is a criti critique on 5G that 5G is basically a configurable LTE, right? So the, the, the standardization communicate, uh, community added more configurability to LTE and just for marketing purposes, they gave it a different name, right? But in the end, your core technologies did not change, but uh, you, you, know, you reduced slot sizes, you opened up a new spectrum, but in fact, you did not change much because there was a big change as the wireless industry moved from 3G to 4G, but uh, from 4G to 5G, they did not see that that big change happening. They did say that it's, you added more configurability, so you can call it as a configurable LTE, right? Some, uh, that's one critique that the people do. But let's talk more in detail that once they introduced these uh, multiple numerologies, which I was talking of, that you can have different packet sizes, right? You don't need to wait for one millisecond. You can do it in uh, 500 microsecond or 125 microsecond. How to, uh, that's something that added configurability, but it added a complexity, right? Your hardware became too complex because now your phone doesn't know that whether the frame it is receiving is one millisecond or it's 500 microsecond or it's 125 microsecond. So you have to support all those sizes which added more uh, complexity to your hardware. So, your, uh, so once you add the, those more complexity, that means that your, uh, your chip size is going to increase because it has to now support multiple uh, uh, it has to support these multiple frameworks, right? It's your chip size is going to increase, your area is going to increase, and then your cost is going to increase, which, uh, which the wireless communi community is still struggling how they can optimize uh, different algorithms once they, once they want to deal with these multiple slot structures, which in the wireless field is called multiple numerologies, right? Then, uh, again, low latency, right? You want your device to... Uh, communicate it quickly, right? So let's say if I receive a frame which is a packet of one millisecond, right? My phone would take one millisecond to process it because it needs to decode it, right? It won't, inf so one millisecond packet comes, there is it, let's say it take, it took 0.5 millisecond from tra transmitter to receiver and now the, the receiver has to process it, right? Now the, uh, and it would take maybe two milliseconds to process it. But now the problem is this, that with this low latency, the, the criteria is too strict for the device to process this, uh, let's say 500 microsecond frame in 500 microsecond, right? So that adds to the complexity of the, of the device, right? The device needs to be more complex. More hardware needs to be added to process it quickly, right? That's where the, the industry is, uh, is struggling and trying to figure it out how this, uh, how they can optimize this that uh, they want to reduce the time in which things are processed, they want to wait, make the communication quick, but how uh, they can achieve this. Right, this is again related to this, that you, you transmit some frame and you want to receive and you want to decode and then you want to acknowledge it back to the uh, transmitter, right? So in communication systems it has happened, right? Once uh, once the base station transmits something to the user, user decodes it, and then it has to acknowledge back to the base station that I have received it. That's why you don't see errors, right? Because if the base station doesn't receive that request, it would send it again. So you don't miss an SMS, right? You don't miss a, uh, uh, you don't miss a packet because if it's not acknowledged, base station is going to send it again. So that's where this uh, low latency comes in and it makes the systems more complex because now this whole loop has to be done very quickly, which adds to the uh, complexity, right? Now, ultra reliability, right? So now we are saying that your system should be 99.9999% reliable, right? Which is, which is a good thing to have, but how you can make it, right? So how you can ensure that your device is 99.999% reliable, right? So if it would have been 90% reliable, right? So it relaxes your uh, constraints on your device 
it can it is can be easily measured right but this reliability it's very hard to measure right because you are talking of one error in millions right how you would so it that means that in your testing first you have to run millions of packets to figure it out whether one packet went in error or not right and then how you would design those algorithms that achieve this much of reliability right so that's a challenge which uh, which the uh, which uh, which lt is uh, facing right then we talked of these multiple bands and bandwidths right that lt that uh, 5g or nr is moving towards this millimeter wave it is moving towards uh, towards higher spectrums right this is again adding to your rf complexity right so your radio needs to be complex so once we talk of a uh, we, we talk of this phone right this phone has radio for wi-fi it has a radio for bluetooth it has a radio for cellular right it has a radio for gps right so now these are some ultra wide wideband communication so there are so many radios right there are so many rfs being built into the phone already because you want to support all this right you want your phones to uh, to support all these protocols now these all protocols need different antennas they need different radio circuits right so previously what happened was at least in cellular communication you were only using one or two bands right let's say if uh, 3 gigahertz or 1 gigahertz right but now once this millimeter wave opens up that means that your radio is going to be more complex now you need to put uh, now you need to put different radio circuits whether you are operating in 3 gigahertz or you are operating in 28 gigahertz or you are operating in 60 gigahertz right that's where your uh, these uh, your bandwidths would come in your uh, bandwidths would become complex and the basic thing is your radio circuits would become complex right as you are as now your device needs to cover this whole range previously it was covering only this range right but now just for cellular connectivity right we don't talk of wi-fi we don't talk of bluetooth right we don't talk of ultra wideband we just talk of wire cellular this is the whole range which needs to communicate right you're now one radio cannot cover this complete range you have need to have multi it's similar right your tv antenna cannot capture cellular reception right so for every uh, for every band, for every group of frequencies, you need different antennas, you need different RF boards, you need different filters, right? So these radio frequency boards are becoming more complex as we are moving, as 5G is trying to cover this whole bandwidth, right? So uh, that's one thing that, uh, a challenge that uh, 5G is facing, right? Another thing that it is facing is that we were talking of this uh, ultra reliable or low latency communication, right? So let's say that uh, we are so this is your device or your phone which is communicating with the base station right maybe you are downloading a video or you are making a call right and in and suddenly because there is a sensor that comes up right now the sensor has to communicate some information to you right that maybe your uh, the, the there this is a sensor which is in your heart or there is a sensor in your uh, watch or it's a sensor in your home somewhere which wants to immediately communicate some quick information to you right so that means that sensor would communicate it here right now what would happen is that you are already in the middle of uh, middle of a communication and suddenly a sensor comes up and wants to communicate with you right which they which in uh, wireless community they call as preemption right because a communication is already carrying out and suddenly somebody comes up and wants to preempt so uh, this adds now complexity how this would happen right because you are already receiving something suddenly a sensor comes up and wants to talk to you how it would communicate and how it would uh, how it would be able to communicate it's both once a uh, uh, once a sensor wants to talk to you or you want to talk to a sensor right so that's uh, that's what is called as downlink or uplink right so uh, sorry god what happened Oh, sorry yeah or uh, yeah but in both directions that's uh, that's that's a problem right that uh, that adds complexity to the hardware and uh, still uh, the standard is trying to figure it out how that communication is going to happen right and then as we talked of this uh, beam management right now uh, this is uh, this is one of the Ericsson antenna panels right look how many antennas they have uh, put in uh, in this strip right so this one two one two is indicating different polarizations, but overall you can see these all circles are the antennas, right? How 
uh, the so now the base station is at a place and it wants to communicate with this phone, right? How it would determine that which is the best beam that I can sue? How it can determine which is the location of the phone and how I can steer its beam in this direction? And if it is moving, how it is going to move that beam, right? So if it's I'm static still, it's a possibility uh, the, that the base station can determine the location and can steer or direct its beam towards this phone. But if I'm traveling in a car, now that the beam has to move, right? How it is going to track this move? If I'm in an elevator and I'm moving up and down, if I'm in a train, how uh, that, uh, that uh, is going to happen? So that's a big challenge that, uh, that uh, uh, 5G or NR community uh, is facing, right? So, uh, yeah, so these are all the challenges that I, uh, that, uh, that I wanted to bring up. Which, uh, which, uh, which 5G or NR is facing at, uh, at this moment, right? And the industry is trying to solve those, uh, those challenges, right? So uh, just last, I just wanted to see that how, so we talked of this 5G, we tried to talk of this LTE, right? So how this uh, 5G and NR developed, right? So we already had an LTE standard which was being developed and uh, was trying to uh, come up with the uh, with the enablers to, uh, to satisfy those use cases, right? But then it was this 5G NR that came at this time, and then it provided these additional uh, knobs or these additional flexibilities which we, which, with which we can now enable these uh, low latency, high data rates, ultra-reliable uh, communications. And in the end, they are expected to converge to just one, uh, uh, to one uh, 5G. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, yeah, that's all, uh, yeah, thank you all for your, uh, for your patient hearing, right, uh, so I have my email address here, if you have, uh, if, you have if you want to contact me later, of course, uh, I would put these slides again on the SVCC website, but if you need some more things, yeah, please uh, contact me, yeah, please. Um.